industry, we started with very tall towers, mountaintops, and they kept moving down to smaller and smaller and smaller locations. We see the same thing with the equipment side of the house. I mean, when cellular industry first started, you had you know, shelters that were the size of you know, two bedroom apartments on, on site, and now the cabinets are the size of you know, refrigerators, and, and 5G uh, equipment is even smaller. Um, so it's just a continued cycle that we see over and over again with technology. For us as an industry, I think the biggest challenge is going to be keeping pace with the amount of change that's going to take place. Um, you know, the, the number of small cells that have to be implemented, the number of macrocytes that need to be changed, and the speed with which the carriers want to implement 5G, that's the biggest challenge that we face. You know, each of the earlier technologies took years to, to roll out and uh, kind of meandered through the uh, adoption, but the shift from 4G to 5G, the carriers want to do at lightning speed, and that's going to be the biggest challenge to us. Right, so a huge impact probably on our industry's build out and implementation in many different ways. What about the impact to our overall business model? I, I think the overall impact to our business model, I, I think this is a great time to be on the infrastructure side. Um, you know, the, again, the amount of new sites that the carriers are going to need from uh, amendments to their existing macro sites, to the small cells that they need, to the number of buildings that they're going to need to put the technology in, it's, it's a huge opportunity for us in industry. And I think that, um, that it's just a great opportunity, great time for us to be where we're at today. Absolutely. Certainly an exciting industry that we all get the privilege of working in. I want to stay with you, Alan, just for uh, one more question. If you could um, talk about the technology for just a moment and the importance of automation to the industry. Um, the importance of automation to the industry. You know, well, I, I, again, if, as I look at what I, I interpret automation to mean is, is at the end user front, what is that going to mean? And again, uh, as, um, as, we have to, as we have automation, it, it's just gonna drive the need for denser and more reliable and faster networks. Um, you know, I, I saw a statistic last week, uh, it was the chairman of Huawei uh, giving a, an example. I know that Huawei is not a great term to use in the United States, but it's still an, an applicable, uh, um, example, he said, you know, at current latency speeds, uh, an autonomous car um, will take, um, it, it'll take like 1.6 meters to stop that car uh, in an autonomous world today. Uh, at 5G speeds, that car will move 2.4 centimeters before it can stop. So that's the type of things that automation will bring. But for us as, a, as an industry, those are the types of changes we have to make to make automation reliable and usable. We have to get to that point. You know, having a robot in a refinery that takes, you know, almost a second to stop is disastrous, but a robot in a refinery that can stop, you know, instantaneously is safe. And so those, that's what automation is going to mean. And it's incumbent on us and the carriers to build those reliable networks to make it happen. Absolutely. So you get a break now, Ron. Take Thanks. a break. <laughs> Ron, yes. to move to you. As a tower owner, do you see the same impact, same challenges, benefits of 5G build out? Uh, well, I, I think I'd start with, you know, our 5G future is really yet to be defined. Um, as of today, the standard's not complete. The, uh, the business cases for building out 5G are largely in flux. I mean, there's a lot of promise of what 5G can be, and that's really exciting. And it's also interesting that to, to note that it's a 10 year or a decade worth of investment. And in that regard, every piece of the infrastructure space is going to benefit greatly. Uh, towers will see their fair share, maybe not as much as small cell and some of the more pinpointed technologies. But if you think about the various bands of spectrum that will be necessary, some of which are not even in the hands of the carrier world yet, from low to ultra high, and if you've been following the industry, at 1.700 was, you know, the holy grail, the beachfront property. Now the higher band spectrums have, have moved, uh, have become the places to live, if you will. But if you think of it that way, and you think about the various pieces of the infrastructure world that we are all in, um, each one has 
a corresponding sort of use case as you, th as you look at where it falls in the band. So small cell, probably much higher band frequency uh, that you'll use small cell to deploy, whereas macro sites continue to be more applicable to you know, what I would call your mid-band now. And to deliver the promises of 5G specific to what uh, Alan was talking about with re regard to an autonomous vehicle, you will need lots of cell sites, lots of small cell sites. Um, you're going to need ubiquitous coverage, especially in areas where you know, I don't think you're going to be having an autonomous vehicle out in the middle of the square states. But if you're going to have it in New York City, then you know, you'll need a, a small cell on every corner. If you're going to drive through suburbia, you'll need technology and, and spectrum deployed on every tower that you can find. So I think uh, you know towers will benefit maybe disproportionately to some of the on a on a, on a mass basis to, to small cell, but uh, certainly uh, certainly will have their fair share. And I, one other note I'll make, you know, some of the, one of the, I think it was Stevens at, at AT and T had said that it would require a software upgrade to deploy 5G. You know, that I, in my opinion, that's a yes and a no. I mean, I think with regard to the spectrum that's out there today, that would be a yes. I think if you think about deploying across a new spectrum band, that's always required a new antenna. And given that some of that technology doesn't exist, you know, towers should see additional antennas over the course of you know, the next decade. But back to my beginning, yet to be defined. Thank you. John, <clears throat> excuse me, I can move to you. As a service provider, you may have a little bit different view, and I know um, earlier may, you may have talked about the dream of 5G. Can you explain that for us, please? <laughs> We have some slides. Yeah. Um, I guess the good news for most of us service providers is that uh, the deployment of 5G really hasn't, really hasn't kicked into gear yet. Um, if you listen, I was actually watching TV this morning and I saw a Verizon advertisement talking about you know, the first 5G handset from Samsung and they were kind of equating it to uh, rocket science and NASA and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I love hearing all the marketing stuff. Uh, I think the marketing folks are very clever at talking about a lot of things that aren't quite here yet. Um, so I call it a bit of, at least from my perspective at this time, it's, I call it the myth of 5G. Uh, as Ron mentioned, we don't even have a standard yet. Uh, so I actually have a slide kind of epitomizes what I'm talking about. You can just, slides. How do I, do I have a slide, yeah, yeah. So I know it's hard to see this, but this is actually a 5G design, and, and the 5G design really involves having one antenna per sector that's dedicated, this is for Sprint, dedicated to their 5G band or their, well, their 2.5. And uh, all right, go, go to the next slide. This is actually the picture of what actually gets built. Oh, oh wait, sorry. that went too far. Oh, no, you're cheating. Sorry. That's my. I don't know where to point this thing. Okay. That's there my Xanadu is. slide coming sorry. up next. So. Sorry. Um, all right, so. What this really is for Sprint is uh, this is their 5G deployment that didn't happen. So what they've done is uh, this is the 800 and 1900 uh, RRUs and the antenna. And at the end of the sector mile, it's supposed to be the 5G antenna. So what, this just got built a month ago. So what Sprint's doing, and this is kind of epitomizes what most of the carriers are doing, is they're, they're designing it and they're deploying the hybrid cable but there's no radios and there's no antenna yet. And so um, that's good news for all of us, right? We're gonna have to redeploy to that site. At least it's designed and we did the structural for it, but the 5G deployment actually hasn't really started yet. Awesome, thank you. Danny, any additional comments on 5G and the impact? Sure. Um, you know, I'll start off with just, as, as, as everyone in this room is a consumer, and we're all gonna benefit from 5G, I can't believe that we're going to even be more connected than we are today. There are days I'm trying to figure out how not to be connected. Um, you know, my, not to digress, but my favorite is when, you know, you get a text that says, call me, and then you don't call them, and then they call you, and you're like, you know, some, when somebody buddies. The second, the second step. Right, right, you know, like, why did you just call in the first place? You have some, some of my buddies are these ex-box uh, tough guys that just kind of text me all the time and call me. But, um, I tried. <laughs> there's a game going on here, guys. It's, trust me. It just, I tried. <laughs> and if I'm the only one that does it, I swear to God. <laughs> um, but I did try. No, so we all benefit from that. And in the telecom space, you know, if you had to take 5G and you just say it in one word, I guess I would say it would be more, right? 
there's more bandwidth, and that's because of the massive MIMO and the millimeter wave, and there's more, going to be more macrocytes, more small cells, more fiber, um, uh, and, and no matter where you sit, uh, in whatever seat you sit in, if you're an OEM or you're an infrastructure provider, vertical or horizontal, or if you, even if you're in a services business, everyone's going to benefit. So, I mean, I, I sum it up as more, and it's a, it's a really good thing for the, for the sector. Danny, that was a complete wussification of the word game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> you both lose. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. <laughs> and Jeff, I'm going to also um, have you add your, any additional comments you have on 5G and the impact. 5G is going to be spectabulous. These <laughs> <laughs> so, guys are prepared. So, so I think back to sitting in a, in a, in a room similar to this 15 years ago and the buzz was EVDO. Mm -hmm. And then you go back. Yep, speaking, yeah, thank you. I remember. This on? It's not on. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, I remember being in a room similar to this 15 years ago when the buzz was EVDO. And then five years ago it was LTE. Today it's 5G. I heard the president talk about 6G. But the, the nice thing is that this is, this is, this is, no really. <laughs> yes. Uh, but the nice thing is, as I think everybody said, is this is an evolving business. It never gets stale that those of us on the infrastructure side have been busy fairly consistently for years and years and years. Uh, and the gentleman yesterday in the keynote uh, said something I thought was really interesting, which is as you look back over 10 years, with all the technology deployment, with all of this, that he doesn't see in his company an inflection point of revenue. With all the new technologies, this is a continuum. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be a continuum that, that feeds us all fairly well for the, the foreseeable future. Thank you. Okay, let's move to another um, hot topic that we've all been talking about this weekend too, or this week, is um, small cell. So John, tower companies certainly have had to add this asset to their business model mix, but what about the work involved from the services side? Uh, one of the questions that I often, often get from people is just, uh, you know, ultimately what is going to be the impact uh, of small cells on the macro network. Um, and uh, I think there's a bunch of different answers to that, but uh, um, I want to show a real world example. If you could just put up my, my next Xanadu slide. <laughs> All right, so this is, this is a real world design. This is an existing carrier network in Greenville, South Carolina. And uh, we were tasked with designing um, a data overlay network onto it. And so if you go to my next slide, this is what it means. <clears throat> okay. So we start off with four macro sites. Each of those macro sites are going to get redesigned um, with the data overlay, you know, another frequency band basically. And roughly the ratio is five to one small cells. Uh, and this is, so this is a dense urban morphology. Every macro site stays in existence and just gets, we add more, more stuff, more stuff to that tower. And then we add five small cells for every macro for the data network. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of work, you know. Smaller sites, granted, but the ratio of five to one suggests that there's a lot more network to be built. All right, I want to go to my next slide. This is a non-dense urban. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a business center, so let's just call this urban, urban center. So here we have, hang on, two existing sites. All right, next slide. All right, so that actually, you'll see two purples, hard to see. So we're adding two more macro sites into this one because the reality is the capacity is constrained on the voice network already. So we're adding two more uh, macros and then we're adding roughly probably five to one on existing macros again. So even in the urban markets, um, you know, I don't see small cells so much in the, uh, um, in the rural markets, that's kind of crazy at this point, but at least for dense urban and urban morphologies, we're looking at a five to one ratio. So this is a real world example getting ready to be built. Thank you. The carrier is figuring that out right now. They don't know. I think it will be CRAN, yeah. 
See, now, these are the really difficult questions that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> if I had, went if off I had my article. <laughs> he dazzled you with slides. Yeah, this was. <laughs> you guys have completely maxed me out on my technical ability right there. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> okay. Jeff, I'm going to go back to you. Does Tillman play in the small cell arena? No. Nope. <laughs> no, we don't. Okay. No. Okay. Um, then what about towers versus small cell in the landscape, cost, return, et cetera? Well, I think John slide pointed that out really well, so. right? That it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship or a complementary relationship. That taking down towers and replacing them with small cells I don't think is on the, the, the horizon. Right. Uh, but adding that pinpoint coverage is, is certainly ex essential to keeping, uh, you know, populations, traffic well covered and, and that. So I think there, you know, I, I don't think there's necessarily a tension between towers and small cells. Mm -hmm. I think they're, they live side by side they and always will. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Ron? Yes. Are you building small cells? I'm not. You're not? <laughs> Danny, an easy are you building small cells? No, we're not. We're not building small cells, but we're because of our rooftop portfolio. We're, we're involved in leasing and entitlement and, and installing small cells, um, and that's specifically with the rooftop portfolio that we manage. And then we do some service work um, because of our entitlement background and site act background. We do some service work for some of the carriers um, for small cells, but uh, we're not involved in owning or operating. Um, and it did, it, to be honest, in my, in my shoes, it's kind of tough to sit on the sidelines as you see all the small cell mm -hmm. deployment. But economically, and in the scale that y we would be able to do, pull off at this point, it, it's just not, it just doesn't make economic sense for us. But if we were ever to get into the fiber business, heavy into the fiber business, we would then go right into small cells. Okay. So that's a, a good lead in then. Um, to our next question, Ron, with all of the new in the tower industry the past few years, if we can talk about how we're doing with our existing assets and portfolios. Do you mean new, like Langdon's company? New, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it could be. Yeah. It could what be say? new. Like, <laughs> new like you, Jeff. <laughs> Um, These guys weren't expecting a clown car when they signed up. No problem. <laughs> you don't have to play next time if you don't want to. Uh, what, what I am seeing for the first time in terms of rolling out or preparing for the rollout of new technology is, it, for example, with Verizon, we do a bunch of work for Verizon and we're doing a lot of build the suits for them at the moment. And uh, the, the markets make, no, uh, make it no mystery that it's really densifying the network in anticipation of being able to roll out the mythical 5G um, first. I mean, all the carriers are racing and they all have a different spin on it. So we're seeing densifi densification of the network, which you know, typically would, would involve what we've all come to know as a cell split. But uh, probably more encouraging for the, the, the tower infrastructure side is there's a lot of white space that's starting to get covered. And uh, I was in a meeting this morning, somebody called it uh, parity. You know, we've, um, we've, we've spoken to folks like T-Mobile where the objective is really to match the colors on the map. So if AT&T and Verizon are there, then they want to be there too. And that's, um, that's something we haven't seen in many, many years, covering places you know, maybe where there's very, very little population. So the, uh, I think this is all in anticipation in large part for 5G, uh, going back to the sort of ubiquitous or semi-ubiquitous uh, coverage. And that means you know, good things for towers, actually good things for all the people in this room. You know, we're all sitting here benefiting by a great 30 years of uh, terrific industry that just continues to grow. Absolutely. So on our existing portfolios, our towers, are we at critical capacity level yet? S some of us. Um, you know, I, I mean, to be, to be fair, you know, some of the assets that we've purchased over the years have capacity issues and challenges. Um, sometimes, or vast majority of times, I would say you can make modifications, and it's a CapEx investment that is worth the return. You know, certainly if you're adding a second or a third, or another tenant, I should say, probably not a second or a third. Other times there's drop and swap, so you, know, you, have, you have that. But the vast majority of these challenges, I think, take place in the more dense metro markets, you know, where assets were first constructed um, at the, in the 80s and the 90s. You know, those would be the assets that typically would have the most 
challenges, and then some of the broadcast towers as well. Um, and I think what's, what's probably more interesting to note is as we look to the future, and you look at the size of the massive MIMO antennas, and even some of the FirstNet, and you think about the assets we've had to build as an industry in very difficult zoning environments, canisters, you know, flagpoles, these assets don't work for those new technologies. They don't. Um, they were fantastic over the years for tower companies because two canisters would be required and we all would you know, salivate over charging more rent. Now you're not gonna get any rent. Um, and they'll look for other alternatives and maybe at the end of the day that is the only option and they'll figure something out or maybe it's small cell. But I think looking out as a tower developer, um, we are very careful to try to build towers that will be capable of handling the future ten antenna technologies. And, uh, and we're also really, really careful about buying assets that have limited capacity or fall into this category of a, you know, sort of a, a municipal, a stealth, a unique site, because your upside will be limited. Good. Danny, how do you see tower capacity being an issue? Oh, good, bud. And how are you handling it? on your assets? Sure, so our, our portfolio is relatively young, so we, we really don't have a capacity issue um, with majority of our sites. The sites that we pay close attention to, I think Ron alluded to a couple minutes, a minute ago, is the sites that we acquire. We pay close attention to the capacity of those sites um, and what's left. But I, I think the real question that we contemplate internally when we're building all these sites you know, throughout the year is how much capacity do you need to build for? How much do you really need and what's, what is enough? And, you know, at one point, you know, there was eight carriers, you know, being deployed across the nation. Uh, and you, when we did capacity on sites 10 years ago, I mean, you'd have, have capacity for four, five, six tenants, depending on the equipment that was hung up. If you fast forward to now, um, you know, there are four major carriers and poten potentially only three. And the question is, you know, how much capacity do you build for? And, you know, if you, we, we, our theory is that we built for three plus tenants, and I think, and that's to protect not only the valuation but also the capacity for the for the carriers. And if and, and to shortcut it, to try to build the capacity for just two carriers, and the money you save is really just not worth it economically. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, Danny and Ron, I'm going to ask you both then how you see the build out we're experience, experiencing today, how it will affect the tower industry as a whole. I've gone first every time. It's your okay. time. Okay, go ahead, Danny. You go first. I don't want to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I think we kind of really talked about this. I, it's a trickle-down effect, right? Uh, the more, using the term more again, right? A, from the publics to the privates to the service companies. It's just a trickle-down effect that, again, as, as Mr. Stevens alluded to, you know, he hasn't seen the... The, you know, the brunt of the new work coming up for 5G, but it's coming, and, and I think we're all gonna, it's all, we're all gonna be busy, and, that, and that's a good thing. Uh, okay. um, yeah. The, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm re it's insightful. If you were to look at the growth of, uh, the revenue growth on, a, on, a to on towers over the last five years, you would, uh, you'd largely see that it was all amendment driven, right? Uh, upgrade to 4G LTE. If you look at where we are today, that mix, so if that mix was 80, 20, 70, 30, we can debate it. Um, if you were to look at where we're trending today, you'll find that it's, the mix is going to flip. You know, you're going to see, I think, more macro installs than we've seen in the past. Um, although rev amendment revenue continues to be fairly robust, you're starting to see that, that mix. I wouldn't say flip, let me back up on that, but you're starting to see that mix narrow quite a bit from where it is. And you know, I think that, again, back to my earlier comments, we're talking about not the two, three year of investment for 4G LTE and then bam, the cliff, you fall off the cliff. This is an iterative process, a decade worth of investment in infrastructure where opportunities, again, yet to be defined, will be there for incremental revenue growth across the infrastructure industry and specific to towers. Okay, Alan. You get to speak again. I get to speak again. <laughs> so Vertical Bridge has the largest uh, private portfolio in the country. Any concerns about capacity, and how do you all tackle that challenge? Um, you know, I'm relatively new to Vertical Bridge, and uh, it, I, so I, I can put my historical view of 
the capacity on the is an industry view versus just commenting on vertical okay. bridge. Um, I, because I think vertical bridges portfolio is in a similar condition as, as anybody's. The, the stuff that we've built more recently over the last couple of years is build a suit. I think we've uh, tackled and ensured that there's enough capacity for the future. Um, the stuff that uh, vertical bridge has purchased over the years uh, is in a similar condition to what the industry as a whole has based on its age and its configuration. Um, you know, as we were, as T-Mobile, when I was at T-Mobile, and we were analyzing what we were going to do for uh, amendments and changes for 4G, for 5G, even uh, all the way back in, in 3G, uh, we saw a fairly consistent rate of failure on towers. Um, and, and I kept thinking, where's the cliff? We're gonna hit a cliff sooner or later, uh, and, and it's gonna be 80 or 90% of the towers are gonna have to be modified for the new technologies to go on to. And over the years, it's been a fairly consistent around 18 to 20% of the towers that we had to to uh, make changes to, that T-Mobile had to make changes to, um, it had some type of a modification. And then I kept thinking, well, okay, maybe it's not the percentage, but the cost is gonna go up because the failures are gonna be more dramatic than in the past. And again, over the years, those changes that needed to be made to the sites remained fairly consistent. Now, um, as the industry changes, I think, you know, Danny mentioned that, you know, when a lot of these towers were built, there were seven or eight carriers in a marketplace. You know, so the industry was hoping to get eight tenants. Well, I think that the, the reduction of uh, the number of tenants and the configurations has, you know, the towers that have been built have been consistent in the capacity and the load that they, they can handle. Um, again, I still think that somewhere out there in the future, the older stuff is going to see an increase, but I keep waiting for it to happen and I haven't seen it happen yet. Okay. John, as a vendor, are you seeing an increase in mods or is it pretty much staying same as usual? Um. I don't have a cool slide, but I think I have some pretty cool facts here. So, <laughs> yep, D done with the cool slides. Um, so last year we did uh, just under 5,500 structurals, and uh, I ran an analysis on that. And uh, of the mount analysis we did, 24% of them failed uh, on, a, on, a, on a mod upgrade, which is probably in line with what Alan just said. Um, we did work on a 600-site uh, new build project um, mostly in the southeast and south central, and of those, so this is a you know, this is a brand new installation, not a mod. Thirty six percent of the towers failed, um, which was a fairly high number. Mm -hmm. And the capital costs of these retros are always open to debate on who's going to pay for it, but they were fairly extensive. Um, and we saw the carriers willing to pay roughly up to eighty grand to, um, on the on the mod as a contribution back to the tower owner. So uh, structurals are an issue and will only continue to remain an issue. Okay, I'm gonna stay with you, John. So how do you see your work continue to change from today's mods to 5G work? Um, and what does your workload look like going forward? So last year in 18, um, you know, and I, I kind of look at 5G and I put it into a, a couple of big buckets. So pretty much anything that looks like small cell to me feels like 5G. Um, if I work for a carrier, you know, if I work for T-Mobile and it's L1900, that doesn't that feels like a, a mod. If I work on L600, that feels like 5G. So roughly speaking, about 40% of my work last year felt like 5G, and I think it's uh, you know I don't see myself moving forward doing much that's not at least somehow 5G related. So I, I would probably go on about 80% within two years. Wow. Is that mythical work? Uh, that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> like Xanadu mythical. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so would you say that it's more profitable or does it continue to be a tighter margin? I don't believe service work is very profitable. <laughs> um, you know, we've all been commoditized. Uh, you know, that's where the industry eventually got to, and that's where we're all at right now in, on service work. So uh, it isn't any more profitable. It's, uh, it's, it's a good business, and you have to run a tight ship, and um, every industry eventually gets to a commoditization, and we're there. Okay. Danny, 
So how do you see the state of wireless service providers today? Are they keeping up? Is pricing an issue? Are we properly staffed? And this goes back to our session that we just had earlier where I think it was called the elephant in the room of staffing. Um, how do you, how are you seeing that today? Yeah, I mean, again, I was curious to know what, what John would say, because I mean, he, he does it every day, but we deal with it on the build the suit side with uh, different service codes, and we deal with it when we do third party services. Um, no matter if you are a large service company nationwide or you're just the regional uh, local site act company, um, the, it's, it's pretty tough right now. I mean, the, the pricing pressure is there. It's always been there. Um, the, and then what's happened over the last couple of years is not only is the pricing pressure, but the payment, um, the, the payment timelines have been, have been pushed out. So you have payment timelines pushed out to get paid. You have the pricing pressure on the margins. And, and it's, uh, it's a trickle effect because then when it comes to staffing, it's hard to, you know, to find a pool of employers or independent contractors that are willing to sign up for that. Mm -hmm. um, is pricing an issue? Yes. I mean, we, we, John said it. I've said it. Um, you know, the thing that's, you know, that's kind of ironic about this whole thing is that if you look at, I don't care when you started in this industry, but if you went from uh, the timeline of getting a lease all the way through permit over the last 10 years has not changed, right? Mm -hmm. It really hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still the same amount of months. You push a couple out, you can bring a couple in, mm -hmm. um, but everything else has changed. The pricing has gone down, the uh, metrics, you know, the margins have gone down. And the work is uh, is as hard as it's been for the last ten years, mm -hmm. and, and and that's the key. And I think the takeaway is once you get a once you get a service provider that's really good, you want to keep them happy and loyal, <laughs> so that they do work for you and they don't do work for Xbox tough guys like Ron here. <laughs> yeah, let me. I, I'm going to take a different spin on that. Um, as the industry evolved, the services that we all require. Um, became very local, so it became a very efficient market. And because of what John calls the commoditization, you know, you'd have a standard deviation in pricing of any, you know, call it 10%. If you think about where we're headed and the vast amount of work that will be required for the mythical promise of 5G so you can get real work and not mythical work, um, I think it's just basic economics, the laws of supply and demand. I think there's going to be a shortage of supply and a dearth of demand, and I think that that will play well to certain parts of the services industry. I think folks are going to be able to push prices up. And I'm saying that even though I'm the one that has to pay it. Uh, we've already seen you know, some steel issues, uh, so, they, so it's on the, on the manufacturing side, and we've seen it with some of the construction. You know, th there's a limited, I didn't get to hear the, the last session, but there's a limited supply of people relative to where we're headed in the future. We may be meeting the demands now, but if you have three active carriers deploying 5G at the same time, I don't think we have the resources necessary. So the better companies are going to be able, I think, to push margin up. So you won't be quite as thin, John, right? Better slides next time. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, any comments on, on Working with vendors, service providers. No, you know we have we have a, a, an enormous build going on right now, and 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 geographically concentrated in a lot of areas, and so we are seeing margins go up for our vendors. You know, finding the varsity to work on your sites and meet your schedules and your timelines and your budgets is difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a lot of work out there, and you know we have to balance. We have to keep people busy, but we can't slam them, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's a constant day to day act of making sure that you're meeting your budgets, your timelines, and your goals without overtaxing the people that you have working on it and making sure that they're busy enough. We don't want them to go build towers for Ron. And <laughs> they don't. <laughs> they really don't. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to go back and talk um, on a little bit different part about towers for just a minute, and that is how is the tower m and market for 2019? Ron, would you like to lead that discussion? Uh, we'll let you all participate yeah, in this discussion. Oh, wow. So, It's a great time to be a tower <laughs> seller, for sure. Um, multiples are at historical levels. Said this last year, said it the year before, and the year before that. It's like every year we get another turn on the multiple uh, that, that people are willing to pay for towers. What's most interesting about that today is that it's no longer really driven by the public tower companies. Um, 
we've seen a lot of new money, infrastructure funds come in looking for investments, looking for platform companies. Uh, they found some. I mean, there's certainly a lot of new tower companies out there. And um, th I see that trend continuing. I think that, you know, we're also, the 10 years, relatively low. So while interest rates re remain low and while we have continued investment in the current infrastructure and then the, the promise of growth, that certainly drives multiples up. So I would think that we're sort of stuck here for a while. So if you're, if you're a buyer, it's, it's not a terrific time. If you're a seller, it's probably never been a better time. Um, and I don't see much of that changing. Okay. I'll leave some for some others. Yes. Danny, would you like to address that? God, this is good. Uh, no, I mean, just to, to echo what Ron said, I, I think the, um, you know, one of the, the, the challenges, especially, you know, I, I came from the public side and now I'm on the private side. And the public side, you know, pretty simple. You get a book, you know, a broker would put a book, you'd bid, you know, money, we'd, we'd unlimited money and, you know, you, you were competitive. But when you're now private, it's, it's obviously more challenging. So. It's, it's, what we're finding is that we have to mine most of the, the sites that we acquire um, ourselves because we have to get them before they hit the market. And, and to do that is, 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 is a long cycle. It's, it's challenging and it's, and it's being able to connect with, you know, I'm talking about mom and pop specifically right now. And, and there's a market out there. You just, it's just you have, to, you have to mine it, you have to get in front of it before um, they catch wind that there are those talented brokers that run up the prices and make uh, sellers lots of money. Um, and that's, that's been the biggest challenge. So mm -hmm. we dabble in it, it's, it's hard, um, but uh, you know, there's other companies that are better at acquiring than we are. Alan? Well, uh, I tend to agree with the MOOCs on the other side of the table that um, <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> it's, it really is a great time to be a seller um, and it's, it's just a tough environment out there um, if you want to be a buyer. Um, but I think we have a great industry and lots of great opportunities for the continued development of towers, especially as interest rates stay low and capital stays easy. Um, I think that you'll see um, an acceleration of things change hands as the capital markets change. That's my opinion. Okay. Jeff. Well, I think it's, it's, you know, we're just dabbling in the, uh, the acquisition market ourselves now for the first time, but certainly done it in past lives. And I think one of the challenges that we have is you look at allocation of capital and you see, you know, I can deploy $20 million on build a suit so I can deploy $20 million to buy towers. And that's always, that's always the decision. If, you know, we see portfolios that are trading upwards of 28, 29, you know, sometimes 30 times now. And, you know, a lot of people are selling younger towers, so multiples are really less relevant to that. So single tenant towers, typically you're just trading on a markup, not a multiple of cash flow. And it really comes down to how bullish you are on each individual opportunity. You know, they talked on cost of capital, which is I think at historic lows as new money flows in from family offices, infrastructure funds, endowments that are not expecting double digit returns anymore, that they're pretty happy buying a bond that's backed by, you know, good credit risk tenants. Uh, and, you know, when we look at it and you say, how many tenants, how many more antennas, you know, what is this gonna perform like over the next five years? And you balance that with your build opportunities and if you select those carefully, it really comes down to, you know, a site-by-site -site evaluation. You know, we just, we just uh, were closing on a portfolio that, you know, surprised me because I was actually very excited about the growth opportunities on it. And we very rarely see those. People tend to flip them after some things happen. They, they take a lot of the chicken off the bone before they put them on the market. And it's nice to find those every once in a while. Right. Okay, I think I'm getting a nod that we need to, um hurry on through. So I want to I want to stay with you, Jeff, um, and I want to change it just a little bit to talk about uh, municipalities specifically um, and the, the difficult relationships sometimes that we have. I know yesterday I think it, I heard it referred to as one of the barriers um, to entry. Well, so. it's, it's, you know, I, I, did, uh, I, I did some scoping for a consulting project for a major U.S. city late last year. And the, the spread between carrier expectations and municipal expectations is enormous. Mm -hmm. I sat and met with the mayor and her staff, and they were, their primary goal was to drive revenue. They wanted money. 
-hmm. Well, they also wanted 5G services. And they also want to bridge the digital divide. They want carriers to come in and they want to build first in underserved communities. But we, that's a noble goal, but that's not where the money is. Mm -hmm. And they want to lease their street lights out for $7,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And so obviously the industry has taken a very different view. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other obstacle that we found is that this city, it's you know, a population of over a million people, had exactly one person processing right-of-way applications and a backlog of 2,500. It was taking them 10 months to process a single application, and they were working through it. They had, you know, there was no organization. Every department got to weigh in at any part of the process and kill it or add costs or change designs, and it was very frustrating. But what they also found is when they processed these, they gave a permit, and the equipment wasn't installed, and it still isn't. It was land banking. And that causes an enormous amount of frustration as well. There's some very good companies out there doing this work, and they're very successful getting these things permitted. But there's a gap between the permits and the services being provided. And the cities know it. Yeah. And it's, it's creating even more tension. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Anyone else? So I, I just I have to jump Alan? in and comment on that. Mm -hmm. Because I, 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 I agree that land banking is, is a huge problem. Um, but in, in that the divide between municipalities' expectations and carriers' expectations are, are, are enormous. And I think the only way to solve them is for the, the two of them to actually have meaningful conversations about expectations. Because it's a, it's a chicken and egg situation. The carriers are land banking because it takes 10 months to get an application through. And, uh, and the reason it takes 10 months to get applications through is because carriers are flooding because they are concerned that their applications aren't going to come through. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle that, um, you know, has to end. And, you know, we as service providers to the carriers can help facilitate that as we work. Because we're the ones most times actually in those municipalities on behalf of the carriers more often than they are on, the, on their own. Anyone else? Hey, Alan, how do you think re-election actually plays into, or Jeff even, I mean, you've got elected officials that may have different interests other than the public interest. Have you, have you found a lot of that type of political pressure? You know, absolutely. I, I was in, um, about a year and a half ago, I was in meetings in, in the state of Washington and meeting with um, the, the state senate and some hearings, and there were, it was obvious which of the state senators were uh, up for reelection and pushing an, an agenda that had really absolutely nothing to do with their constituents, but they were, were using that as an opportunity to sway the deployment of, uh, and this was particularly around small cells. I would just think that's a huge, a huge it is. part of how these things roll. And, other, and, and, and some jurisdictions are notoriously bad, and some aren't. I think I'll add to that, that I think that I, I agree 100 percent, but I think the connection is maybe somewhat less direct than you might think. I think people who are up for re-election are pushing technology because that's what the businesses and the contributors want. It's, it's not necessarily an individual constituent effort. It's trying to, trying to bring employment and whatnot. So I think people do pay more attention to that during election cycles. You know, newly elected people tend to have a lot on their agenda. People who are coming up for elections start to take broader views. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else? Okay, um, John, what, what would you say your greatest opportunity as a service provider will be over the next two years? Uh, probably the biggest trend we see, you know, other than saying the obvious that it's going to be something like 5G, uh, the biggest trend we see with the with our customers is uh, really two things. So they're stripping out their middle management, you know, as they try to lower their own OPEX. So we see Verizon laying off 40 or early retirement, 44,000 people, some, somewhere between January of this year and through March. We see most of is doing the same thing. If the merger goes through with T-Mobile and Sprint, we know they're gonna strip out a bunch of the operations staff. So understanding that, that they're ripping out kind of the middle management, they're looking to firms you know, like all of us out here who can handle more of a, we've got to handle more of the project management, we've got to handle more of the turnkey because they just don't have enough people to manage the process. So um, what that means is, uh, the other half of that is that all the payment terms are going to 90 days with pretty much every single carry at this point. So you've got to, you've got to finance the build. It's kind of like the AT&T turfing model a little bit. 
and you've got to be big enough to handle more of the turnkey work. So what we see is the smaller service firms are, are slowly getting squeezed out. And we saw that a couple of years ago. So, you know, out of necessity, we had to get bigger in order to handle that kind of thing and be able to handle the cash flow, which is always a challenge. So that's the biggest opportunity. I think if, if you're big enough to handle on a turnkey basis and you can cover the cash flow, two challenges right there, but that's, that's the opportunity. Okay. What about tower companies? What do you see as your greatest opportunity over the next um, couple years? Um, mine would be if Ron called me and offered me 45 times. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good opportunity. That would be one or, or Gelman. Um, no, we're not for sale. My private equity guys are here. I did, did that on purpose. Um, they're puckered up now. Um, no, but just, again, we, we are a build a suit company, um, and we, are, uh, we have a pretty healthy pipeline, and it's just getting these sites up for the carriers and all the work that we have in the pipeline today, I mean, yep. to be honest with you. Getting things across the line. Yep. Yes. Uh, no secret that carriers are in cap, capex conservation mode. You know, to echo or to play off of what John said, I think similarly to the services companies, a lot of the tower companies, I'm sure Danny's seeing it, and I would expect vertical as well, we're seeing that carriers are offloading sites to build the suit companies after their, let's call it real estate complete or construction ready, whatever terminology you want to use. Hadn't seen that in the past. Um, and I think you'll see more of it. I mean, it's no mystery that at and is divesting of non-core assets. You know, I think that continues. And I think that, you know, that, well, of course, they have a large build to suit project going on. Verizon, similarly, definitely, in, I've seen it definitely be in the CapEx conservation mode and um, more opportunities to build as a result of that. So, and I think that trend is, is here for a while. I mean, they, they fluctuate greatly over the 30 years I've been in this industry. One year it's OPEX, the next year it's CAPEX, but I think it's CAPEX for a while. And they've already demonstrated that it's OPEX by you know, offering some of the early packages, at least in Verizon's case. Mm -hmm. Sure. Opportunities over the next couple of years? Well, I think uh, Ron said it really well. Everybody said it really well. But I think uh, you know, some of the trends that might be coming up are as they divest non-core assets, I think that might also include whole sections of network, I think. Mm -hmm operating small cells as a service to, to offload both the manpower and operational things. So I think there's, there's a whole lot of things on the horizon that, that infrastructure providers can focus on. And as people come out of the carriers, we're seeing you know, quite the opposite of a brain drain right now. And Vertical Bridge capitalized on it recently. You've got an experienced, capable manager coming out of a carrier, and that's a brilliant thing to add to your tower company. And you know, we look to do the same thing and, and tap into that knowledge and that culture to be able to evolve the company from where we are now, which is strictly building towers, into buying towers, into working on, you know, everybody's interested in fiber, but also going to that next part where, you know, you might be able to own and operate sections of a network. You may be able to offload travel routes, uh, venues, and those things, which has obviously been going on for quite a while. But I think the scale is going to grow over time. Interesting. Alan? <laughs> um, I really don't have much to add to what that's already been said. I think there's, generally speaking, there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity in lots of different areas. And I think, um, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, the 5G deployment as it's coming. We've talked about small cells. Um, you know, there's other opportunities in, you know, for us as an industry around, you know, edge computing. Is that, what is that going to mean to us? Are there opportunities there for us? Jeff talked about offloading parts of networks. Um, you know, there's, there's talks of, uh, you know, carriers hiring you know, infrastructure companies to basically build a, a roaming network for them and, and then operate that for them. So um, it, it, there's so many different avenues, I think, that they'll start to crystallize uh, over the next, you know, 18 to 24 months as, as things start to get closer in and there's greater opportunity. But Overall, you know, this is an amazing industry to be in. Is in my almost, you know, my, my 25 years of experience in here, in this industry, uh, it's just been a, a continued upward growth opportunity, and I don't see it slowing down. The only thing I'll add is, and then we didn't really talk about it, but regardless of what side of the fence you sit on with the potential merger of the two carriers, if it ends up being three or stays four. Um, once that kind of we get past all that, when the stage is finally set, I mean th things will be a little bit more clear, and then uh, that's we're looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I know. I stand here and I just am constantly thinking, what a privilege to work in this industry. I mean, 
I'm not sure that you could go to just any industry conference and hear this growth over the last 20 years that I've been involved in it. And it's, I don't recall going to a conference and it being negative. I mean, our industry is constantly changing. Technology is keeping us all jobs and growing. And, and I hear the most positive panel session today that I, I think I could have heard of anywhere. So um, I don't know if Steve's gonna give me time for Q&A or not. No, no Q&A. Okay, I'm sorry. Can I end with one crystal ball question then that, I mean, I know. Uh, no, he said no. Uh, but you can talk to them afterwards. Okay, but this one's more important. Okay, so this is the most important question of the day. And you got, and you got the mic. <laughs> sorry, Sharp, I love you. You know that. Okay, so we're in the middle of March Madness. I need to know, what's your prediction? <laughs> Who's going to win the tournament? Duke. Duke. Michigan. Michigan. I abstain. Abstain? <laughs> That's probably a good idea. Thank you so I, much. I have, I have one oh. last question, please. Yes. I'd like to ask the audience, which of us you think used our ridiculous word best in context today? <laughs> Whether it's Xbox, tough guy, spectabulous, <laughs> mook. Wussification. Wussification. Oh, come, oh, come on. on. I'm out. Winner. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, guys.